global connections, how the war is affecting the Ukrainians here in Think Tech. I'm Jay Fidel. That's Carl Ackerman for our two o'clock show. And we're going to talk about, um, you know, his background in Ukraine, his understanding, appreciation, his insights into the people, the place, the culture and their potentialities. Welcome to the show, Carl. Thank you, Jay. Always a pleasure to be with you. And that's Excellent. meant, it, you know, with no hyperbole. <laughs> Same here, Carl. So, Carl, you have a you have a, a family connection, a life connection with Ukraine. Can you talk about it? Qualify yourself as a witness to what's going on. Well, you know, um, not only am I trained as a, as a you know historian of Russia, but when I was uh, fourteen years old, um, my parents, who tended to be very um, crazy uh, in a good way, uh, decided to take a VW camper trip. This was in 1969 from Leningrad to Sochi. And of course, on the way, we stopped and then what was part of the Soviet Union, the Ukraine, and stopped in what was then called Kiev, uh, you know, Kiev. And um, it was a sensational city. Um, you know, three quarters park at that time, absolutely beautiful, of course, under Soviet rule. Um, so it was a totalitarian state, but the people were very kind. And um, in addition to that, um, my wife and I, um, when I was a, uh, a Russian historian and, um, and also teaching Russian history and European history at Ilani School many years ago, we were scheduled to go to um, Kiev as part of a uh, Nickel and Brown, uh, um, a East Coast uh, prep school. They had a summer trip and we were going to be the chaperones. And Unfortunately, it was the year of Chernobyl and my wife was pregnant at the time. So we didn't want our children to, to light up at night, um, <laughs> not, not to be enlightened, but, uh, but to light up at night. And it was just a horrible thing. And uh, I, was, I was visiting Russia later on as part of my career as a Russian historian. And um, I was staying in a, a Soviet hotel and before me, um, years before me on this, on the, on, uh, this visit, um, the children of Chernobyl, who were very sick from the nuclear accident, um, happened to be staying in the same hotel. And um, the director and I became very good friends. And she told me, you know, what had happened with these kids, which was, you know, many of them died or, you know, were severely um, um, hurt by, of course, the nuclear plant in, the, in Chernobyl. In, in ways that no one could even anticipate every disease in the book. Absolutely. And, you know, they were very sick kids. And she said it broke her heart every day because these kids were staying in her hotel. And I, I understand why. I think, I think we all need to know more about Russian history. <laughs> you know, when I was in school, I guess in grade school, a, a lot of people were fascinated with Russian history. It was on the other side of the Cold War. Um, and you know the, those were the those were the people who were going to throw the bombs. That's why we got uh, duck and cover under our desks in those days. It wasn't the Chinese; it was the Russians, and we were all afraid of them. And um, you know, so uh, a number of people that I knew specialized in Russian history, and and of course, um, you know, if, if you're Jewish, Russian history means more to you because there was a fair amount of anti-Semitism. And uh, maybe more than a fair amount. And and the pogrom, like that, that's a Russian word. And it was invented in Russia. And there were, may I say, thousands of pogroms around the, the turn of the 19th century, um, turn of the 20th century, depending on how you calculate it. Um, and and for that matter, that's what you know drove my my family to come here from Ukraine, from a little town near Kiev. Um, called uh, Kamenets Podolsk, uh, both sides of my, and in fact, there was an organization in New York called the Podolia Society, where a lot of people came from that area in Ukraine. But, um, <clears throat> you know, um, the Ukrainians were also complicit uh, in those pogroms, uh, and they were complicit in the, in the Holocaust uh, 20, 30 years later. And, um, you know, when I hear the stories about how nice and kind they are, I say, OK, um, the world has changed a lot and the Ukrainians have changed a lot and they are truly nice and kind. They, they somehow have 
have braved all the storms. They braved all the Russian maneuvers on them. Um, and they've come out okay. I mean, as a culture, as a group. And I want to ask you if that is true. I think that's true. And I want to go back to your original comments, Jay. And, uh, you know, my family on my mother's side, of course, my, with a name like Karl Ackermann, I, I, you know, my, my father's family were, and were immigrants from, in the 19th century, German Jewish immigrants. But my mother's family came from that great Polish-Russian border. Ukraine, Ukrainian also is uh, connected here. And uh, many Jewish Americans came from this area and migrated to New York City in um, in the early part of the 20th century. And so, you know, I, like you, are part of this big migration. And so there's a natural inclination. And, you know, um, at that time there, you know, in the Ukraine, there was a lot of poverty. And I remember my grandmother saying, eat everything on your plate because think of the poor starving Ukrainians. And I, and I thought to myself, wow, you know, and then now, now of course, this, this, uh, this horrible thing is happening. And uh, to give you some background on this, um, and I think, you know, people are not getting sort of the, the deeper history of, of Russia here. And, you know, um, Peter the Great, who lived in um, basically, you know, was I think born roughly around 1682 and uh, basically died in 1725, if I've got my dates right, uh, you know, lived in the, you know, 17th century and early 18th century. He started to westernize Russia until that time Russia really was a sort of backward, well, I don't know about backward, but it was at least a more directed um, in, in, in Central Asia, as opposed to being part of Europe. And Peter the Great very much made uh, Russia part of Europe. Well, what this creates in Russia is a big divide between those Russians who want to be tilting towards the West, and like, you know, Mikhail Gorbachev did recently, and those who are traditional Russian Slavophiles, like, for example, Fyodor Dostoevsky, the great uh, Russian writer. And... Um, uh, and, you know, Vladimir Putin comes out of this tradition. And to make Vladimir Which Putin- Which side? He comes out of the, the Russian, you know, Rush, great Russian uh, nationalist tradition. And in the 19th century, they even gave names to it within the Russian literate. Uh, they called the Westernizers um, exactly that, Westernizers. And the deep Russian um, nationalists were called Slavyanophili or Slavophiles. <laughs> And uh, Putin is uh, Vladimir Putin, President Vladimir Putin, is a Slavophile, most, most, most directly. And of course, he's not a 19th century; he's a 21st century. And um, you know, like liberals in, in different periods, it has different meaning. And for his, is it's a, it's 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 a very dangerous meaning. Um, in addition, you know, he's a, a ex KGB agent from East Germany, and he was there when the wall fell, and he had to destroy papers. So this is a man who went into the most conservative. Uh, reactionary uh, part of the former Soviet Union, he saw the empire fall, was completely embarrassed by this, saw Russia come apart. And his main objection is, uh, his main um, goal, object, is to uh, restore this empire. In addition, you know, one of the problems we face in the United States is that a series of presidents have tried to understand Putin and they think that personal diplomacy can change Putin's attitudes. And they're entirely incorrect about this. I mean, Putin is a great Russian nationalist who wants to expand his country. And, you know, George Bush um, Jr., a, a wonderful man and president, um, you know, I didn't agree with everything and I don't think anyone does, but I don't want this to become Democrat versus Republican, said that he could see his soul. But um, I think John McCain was better at, at seeing things. He said, you know, I, you know, uh, Bush's comments, I looked into his eyes and I could see his soul, you know, indicating that he was a good guy down deep. And John McCain said, I looked into his eyes and saw KGB agent. And um, I think John McCain had it, had it right. And uh, well, is he, is he pathological? Whatever the cultural background, you know, some of these moves on a global scale, I mean, evaluating it from, you know, a point of view of humanity. Uh, make it, you know, it does suggest that he's he's a nutcase, unhinged. Uh, and some of his moves have really been hard to understand from any rational point of view. Well, the problem with totalitarian leaders um, and any leader who becomes sort of a, you know, right-wing autocrat is they don't tend to listen to other people. And that's the great 
part of our democracy, whether you're a Republican or a Democrat or independent. You know, if you have a leader in the United States, most of the time, and especially under this president right now, he listens to other people. And you, know, you have to do that um, in order to get a variety of different ideas. So that's, that's one thing. The second thing is, you know, um, uh, Vladimir Putin realizes that the great invasions into Russia, one with Napoleon in 1812, and then, you know, Operation Barbarossa with the Nazis in um, 1941 um, were very painful for Russia. And he wants to buffer his borders, uh, but he doesn't understand that the world has changed and that no one's going to invade him. And by the way, the Ukrainians gave up their nuclear weapons with the notion, through a series of agreements, you know, at Belgrade, et cetera, in, 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 um, in Port and Lisbon agreements, a series of agreements. They gave up their nuclear weapons to the United States and the and, the, and Russia were supposed to protect their integrity. But he's, he thinks that he can do, and a lot of pundits, Jay, say, well, this is, um, you, we haven't seen anything like this since World War II. Wrong. We've seen it in, in Hungary in 1956. And we've seen it in Czechoslovakia in 1968. And these were quick in, incursions. And this is what I think Putin thought was going to happen. And now he's in real trouble because, you know, the army has not been successful. The Ukrainians are fighting him tooth and nail. He didn't expect this. You know, he really, and, you know, from my experiences with the Russian government, now that they got in, it's very hard for them to admit, you know, any Russian leader in the recent past, with the exception of Mikhail Gorbachev, but they were wrong. And they had to, they have to pull back. But it's a loss people, of face. Yeah. It's a loss, it's a loss of face of, and therefore a loss of power. Correct. And, you know, it, uh, Vladimir Putin realizes that this is not successful. Um, this might mean, you know, removal from power for on, 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 you know, for him. And once you're removed from power, you know, who's, who's going to protect this man who has uh, been dastardly to many Russians internally. So it's a, it's a, he's playing a dangerous game. And I don't know, I don't know what a good solution for Vladimir Putin would be, but I don't expect that the negotiations will lead to much unless the Russians are willing to pull back, which I doubt that will happen. No, they're not going to do that, not for the reasons you you identified. So, um, okay, so we have a real problem with him. I mean, one of the things I thought was completely irrational is uh, trotting out the notion of nuclear weapons. And in fact, um, you know, putting them on standby. Right now, they are on standby. And I, I, I take that seriously. He instructed his military to put nuclear weapons on standby against a country that doesn't have nuclear weapons, that gave nuclear weapons up as a matter of principle. Um, uh, that's extraordinary. What in the world would he do with the nuclear weapons? Just destroy the whole thing into a parking lot? Make it all Chernobyl? Uh, what, you know, what, what in the world did he do that for? That sounds irrational. That sounds pathological. Well, you know, Historically, um, when people did not know a lot about nuclear weapons, there were American diplomats in the early 1960s who talked about limited nuclear warfare, which limited nuclear warfare. <laughs> I have to emphasize the word limited. Uh, you know, that's insane. And, you know, anytime you talk about nuclear war, this is insane. And of course, you know, the most famous case was the Cuban Missile Crisis. And, and luckily, calmer heads prevailed. But, you know, even in the in the Politburo, you know, you had people who were discussing things. And my fear about Putin is that he's not really listening to people. Now, people have talked about his craziness, and and you know, he's he, he in one sense he is crazy because of the things that he's doing and his lack of humanity. But on on the on the other way, I think that he's a shrewd Machiavellian player. And he's looking for, you know, you know, I think the best way out of this. And he's probably under the, you know, I think probably what he's thinking now is that, you know, once we get control of, of Ukraine, then I can, you know, back off and do some things. But, you know, I'm not sure that's going to that's going to happen. And, you know, for the life of me, Jay, as a, as a history guy, I don't understand why after the American Revolution, where this group of tiny colonialists uh, beat back the greatest power, military power of the day, the British, um, that people don't get it. <laughs> you, when you invade another country, um, you know, and, and the people don't want you there, it's a losing, uh, it, it's a losing um, proposition. And 
I have a story related to Hawaii that I think you will enjoy is that, um, you know, when uh, President Medvedev had taken over four year, for four years from uh, Vladimir Putin, and he was here in Hawaii for an economic summit, someone asked him at a gathering, I had a close friend who was at the gathering, do you have any advice for us about Afghanistan? And normally, the protocol is that he would go, he would turn to, he would say something to his interpreter, and his interpreter would, would then tell this American what, what he was thinking. And he didn't even do that. He just said, get out. And um, this is what the Russians, if they're smart, they'll uh, negotiate something with the Ukrainians and just get out, because this is a losing proposition for the Russians, no matter what. And um, let us hope that Vladimir, that there are calmer people that can get to Vladimir Putin and say, listen, nuclear weapons is a, is a, is a no-win game. Well, but, but this, this continued attack is a no-win game also. <clears throat> so a question, you know, that in St. Petersburg, hundreds of thousands of people showed up despite the risk of being arrested and thrown in jail. Uh, for indefinite periods without civil liberties, they showed up anyway and opposed uh, and protested. And we have photographs of that. That's the most interesting part of this war is that the photographs get out, the movie clips get out, the phone calls get out. And what he did today is very interesting. He knocked off the television towers in Kyiv. And I was waiting for him to do that. But it's still going to get out. It's going to get out to Western Europe. It's going to get out to those people who would charge him with atrocities and war crimes who are already readying that attempt. Uh, he's going to have a worldwide problem about atrocities. If I'm, the, if I'm the country of Russia and I have billions of dollars in foreign banks, which I probably do, to say nothing of the oligarchs, what they have in the banks, <clears throat> People representing lawyers, representing the victims, are going to be able to sue them for reparations, compensation, and criminal atrocities. And, and this is sitting pretty. It's another huge miscalculation. Uh, he didn't realize that the evidence is all getting out. It's all accumulating against him. They can prove the case right now. Anyway, so my question, first question, breaking it down, is the people in Russia, you, uh, you know, you mentioned the possibility that he would be ousted uh, and he would be thrown out of power and he would be a great risk, personal risk, because there are a lot of people in Russia who don't like what he's doing. So query, what is the Russian character um, that interacts with these issues? Uh, some Russians are with him. There was a story on uh, National Public Radio about a, a woman who was... Um, her mother was uh, Ukraine. She lived in Ukraine. Her mother's Ukrainian. Her father's of Russian, and they they were both mad at the uh, they were mad at the Russian. They weren't speaking to the father anymore. They're blaming him for the whole thing, whether or not he was at fault, um, and and um, you know that kind of uh, divisiveness. So I guess the question is, what is in the Russian character that a makes them accept what Putin does? It sounds like fear to me. And B, what makes them go out on the streets of St. Petersburg and resist and protest against what, you know, where is Russia these days? Well, you know, um, first, let me acknowledge what you just said, that, that uh, Jay, that, you know, there is a, you know, that Russia has been, um, th there have been attacks on the, on the press under Putin. There, you know, when people disagree with Putin and even go abroad, they're poisoned, you know, as, as, as we all know from the incidents in, in, in England. And Navalny, um, don't forget Navalny. And Navalny, of course, has been imprisoned. Um, and so- And poisoned. All, yes, and poisoned, you know. First you're poisoned, then you go to prison. And, 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 and the thing years. is that people, people wonder whether there's a direct connection between Putin and uh, the poisoning. There's no question, no question whatsoever about that. No, Anybody no, would know that, make that connect those dots. You know? You know, and, that, and that's, you know, I mean, you know, you have to remember he's KGB. I mean, that's that's where he got his training. I mean, you know, I mean, anyway, but I, I this is really good. Your points are really good, Jay. And then um, let me go back to a comment that you made earlier about, you know, getting signals out and, and uh, what you did um, on, you know, on Think Tank, which was just wonderful. So you put that wonderful New York, New, uh, New York Times article editorial by Thomas Friedman and and his point was that, you know, this is a new world you're invading, but it isn't, it isn't the partition of Poland, you know, in the, in the um, 1800s, I mean, the 1700s, but it's, uh, it's, the, it's the partition and the takeover of Ukraine with all the modern technology features that can 
you know, cover everyone, you know, and the, and the important role of, of groups like TikTok and Facebook and things like that. How marvelous, um, because, you know, this is the way people are really showing what's, what's, what's going on. So that's, that's, um, that's, that's, a, that's a critical, critical, critical um, uh, piece for all of this. And um, to give you an indication of the Russian character, well, you know, one has to realize that for most of Russian history, I mean, going back to the time of the Mongols and Ivan the Terrible and Ivan the Third before him, you know, you've never had, you know, the, the fundamentals of democracy. And the first democracy came, you know, in 1905 with the establishment, you know, after, you know, the Russo-Japanese War and the general strike and you get the Duma, you know, and Duma um, is a word that comes from the Russian verb du Dumats, which uh, means, you know, to think. So, you know, a thinking body, as it were, with the Greek statue, right? So, uh, um, uh, bad analogy, but, you know, you get the point. But anyway. Rodin, <laughs> Rodin. The, yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, the penseur. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So, you know, so you, you had a brief experiment with democracy, and then you, um, you know, you have from 1905 to 1917, and then the Bolsheviks take over with the coup d'etat. So the, the next flowering of um, democracy comes with, uh, you know, the advent in the 80s of, of uh, Mikhail Gorbachev. And that was a fascinating period because I was teaching in, in uh, special school 238. I was teaching English. And um, the Russians were throwing out all their old textbooks that had many allusions to Uncle Karl Marx and um, Uncle Vladimir Lenin. And um, we're really exploring things in their traditional thick journals from the 19th century and um, experimenting with democracy. And, you know, it's, it's, it's a credit to uh, Mikhail Gorbachev and then uh, Boris Yeltsin, um, and where there was a lot of flowering of democracy, but there also was a lot of problems economically. And so what Vladimir Putin did is he came in and he was he acknowledged the democracy at first, but then started to tighten things up the way he liked things. And then, you know, um, as as people have mentioned, you know, now Russia is a is really a one product economy, and you know, I mean. If you look around and you, you, you know, like uh, Jay, you and I are in Honolulu. Do we see a Russian car like the Moscovich? No. Um, do we see, you know, a, um, a special type of a shirt to wear that you might get from Italy? No. So what's Russian's main product? It may, they're, they're, it's, it's gas. And besides that, there's, there's vodka. And I, 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 I really <laughs> enjoy seeing the scenes of, you know, Americans, you know, taking vodka off the shelf. But of course, these are sometimes retailed by other people. And that's a very simplistic answer. And when I was in Russia, um, you know, many years ago, and with my parents, and then again, as a Russian historian, many times, um, there was also at that time under the Soviet Union, very inexpensive caviar. So you have caviar, vodka, and, uh, and uh, oil, and uh, natural gas. And what I what I didn't realize- you, know, you can't get along on those things, I'm sorry. No, you can't, well, I mean, the, of course the main product, you know, I'm kind of joking about the vodka and the caviar, but, um, but it's, I mean, it's true, but it's, it's not to the same level. But what I was really um, interested in is that, um, according to, you know, an article in our local newspaper, Jay, the Star Advertiser, like 20% of our, our uh, petrol comes from Russia. And I was unaware of this completely. I thought it came from Australia. Or, I, th I thought it came from Indonesia. Yeah, or Indonesia, Asia, right. it, it changes is the point. Yeah, you know, I, from I, decade to decade, you have, have a whole kaleidoscopic change in where the oil comes from. Well, I, I was amazed and I thought, you know, I was talking to my wife and I said, of course, you know, it's probably, you know, um, sold by a variety of different people who were the, the second people or the third people um, to get the oil. So, you know, and, and of course, in our papers, I said, there's not going to be a problem. So but we shall see. But well, you well, know, the cultural, the cultural change, when you talk about Hawaii, you know, um, yes, there, were, there was trouble with Kamehameha pushing people off a cliff back when. You know, and if you walked down in somebody's shadow, each shadow, you, you were going to have, well, you're going to lose your life, actually. Um, but, you know, since then, and, and since uh, certainly, um, you know, the overthrow, there hasn't been any internal violence here to speak of. And um, we have, we have no, nobody's uh, attacked us, you know. And, and, and that's so for the whole United States. We haven't had people crossing our borders, aside from, you know, the war of uh, 1812 and 9-11. Uh, and, and, and I suppose you can say the insurrection. We really haven't had domestic organized violence. Um, but if you go to Europe and if you go to the borders of Ukraine and all of Eastern Europe, you find people crossing the borders, taking what they want, 
um, raping, pillaging, stealing, destroying, you know, for generation after generation, you know, all of the history of Europe, and I'm not a historian of Europe, um, all of the history of Europe is loaded with that sort of thing. It sets up a different way of looking at the world. It sets up a different cultural mindset. And we here in Hawaii, we have trouble appreciating how it is to have generation after generation subject to violence and, and pogroms and border violations and invasions and death and killing and, and really bad stuff. And that's what Europe is made of. And that's certainly what Eastern Europe is made of. So, and Russia has been involved in that. And Russia has been the subject of oppression and violence and um, not, you know, undemocratic and uncaring government for a very long, very long time, despite Glasnost. And, and I, you know, I want to take a moment because you mentioned the United States and Hawaii also. Um, um, sometimes, you know, uh, uh, before the overthrow of Leo Polani, uh, Hawaii, uh, Hawaii being a separate nation. And then, um, of course, there was the attack by the Japanese during World War II, but what you're talking about is actual invasion and occupation. And I think you're very right about this, Jay. I think that we haven't had that experience, but I'm, I'm, thinking, um, I'm thinking also that um, two things. And um, in this discussion today, I wanted to say, uh, you know, I think there were things that led up to this um, invasion um, and the calculation um, by Vladimir Putin. And, there have been um, pundits who point to <clears throat> us getting out of Afghanistan and, and uh, Joe Biden, our president, um, showing weakness. And I would argue just the counter. I would argue that this has been a long time coming because American presidents have been very naive about, um, um, in particular, George Bush Jr. Um, and of course, Donald Trump, um, been very naive about um, uh, the United States relationship uh, to um, Vladimir Putin. And of course, you know, uh, President Trump even uh, sided with Vladimir Putin against his own internal um, agencies, which I think was a, was a, critically t uh, a critical mistake uh, because that opened the doors, I think. So if you look at um, all of this in a larger context, um, President Biden, by getting out of Afghanistan, imagine if we were still in Afghanistan and fighting, you know, there oh, also. Gosh, and yeah. we're not fighting there, but supplying us. Good and point, actually, good we might be point. Yeah. So, so, you know, what he has done in retrospect is um, very um, nuanced. And, you know, he follows in the tradition of sort of the real politique of um, Otto von Bismarck and Henry Kissinger. Um, Henry Kissinger, I think, you know, regardless of whether you agree with him on, on different levels, I in some areas I don't, is, is, was the greatest statesman of the later part of the 20th century. And we should listen to him. And what he's what he did behind the scenes is he created this whole NATO, that is President Biden, not Henry Kissinger, um, this whole NATO alliance. And, you know, he did it quietly, diplomatically. And I heard Tucker Carlson praise him the other day on Fox, because I'm a, someone who believes that you should listen to um, all news media, but uh, Think Tank Hawaii is the very best. Well, let me, but, let me, let me <laughs> offer you a thought, Carl. This is really sure. interesting. <clears throat> Trump did what he could for reasons that are, in my view, very clandestine and nefarious, sinister reasons, um, you know, to push NATO around, to diminish its authority, its, its uh, cohesiveness. The same with the e EU. He did all of that. Now Biden comes, comes in. We have Ukraine, which is a monumental um, historical event in this century, for sure. Um, and he brings the coalition together. Query, though, it was, here's a proposition for you. It was time. It was ripe. Trump had, Trump had raised the issue and did destructive things to NATO and the EU. And now if some American leader could come back and resurrect that, it was the perfect time for him to do it. It was waiting for him to do it. He, he might not have had the same advantage if Trump hadn't done his destruction a few years ago? I, you know, I think that, um, that a lot of the blame for um, Vladimir Putin's arrogance right now and um, uh, has to do with 
the United States being divided, you know, from what he, he could tell. And I think that, you know, President Trump, you know, whether you're a Republican or a Democrat, I'm not trying to get into politics here, but I think that, that he divided the nation and he also, you know, gave carte blanche to Vladimir Putin. And I think that you, when you give carte blanche to a, you know, pretty ruthless, well, to a ruthless dictator, um, um, this is what happens. And I think, you know, um, Joe Biden is a traditional um, political expert, and he's going to rely on people who he knows. He's going to think about things, but he's got many years of experience. And I think he handled Afghanistan well, despite us having problems getting out. I mean, who can get out of a country when you've been invading them for a while? I mean, look what happened in Vietnam. And, um, and then with this, you know, so far, um, this has been wonderful. And I applaud the president for not getting involved in no-fly zone because you don't want Russians and, um, and Americans um, fighting each other directly because that's going to lead to some very serious consequences and could very easily lead to a nuclear war. So he has been very, very um, um, astute. And what he's produced is his coalition. And I remember the, you know, the, the slogan from um, the 1960s that the you know more radical students were would always say they say the whole world is watching well the whole world is watching and it's because of you know the the thomas friedman uh what thomas friedman said that you know you have a lot of people who are who are, are watching this you know in in real time and um one of the things i wanted to share with you jay is, is president Zelensky said uh, that uh, Vladimir Putin is a war criminal. And here's, here's what I would suggest for the United States now, is I think we should start setting things up now um, in The Hague, make it very public, and say to those Russian generals, if you follow him, you are a war criminal too. Yes. And, for the Russian, and for the Russian soldier, if you commit atrocities in Russia, I, pardon me, in the Ukraine, you are a war criminal too. And we should have another Nuremberg, and we should prosecute these guys and um, put them in jail for the rest of their lives. I, yes. I think that, I is, think this, that, you know, is this what you were telling me you were going to raise and you thought yes. I'd be surprised and shocked? Yes. I'm not surprised and shocked. Okay. I think that's a wonderful idea and it's a doable idea too. Well, you know, I just think, I think it's, you know, I mean, I, I tend to be, you know, centrist and, um, and reserved in saying things like this, but I think it's time to do this. And I think that, you know, I hope that, you know, um, President Biden today in his uh, State of the Union will uh, say something akin to this, um, but it's time. And, you know, can you, I mean, my, my wife, my wife was walking through and watching uh, CNN, she being a very bright woman, and she said, how can they do this? They're invading a, you know, a, a country that has, you know, that has done nothing to them. And that's that's uh, what my wife says. Maybe they know each other. <laughs> and, 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 you know, and, and um, you know, I always trust Lynn's opinion because she's, you know, um, you know, 95% of the time I write about things. And, you know, I give myself about 40%. So there we go. Well, you're, you're an historian. I have one last question for you because sure. we got a break, uh, not only because we're out of time, but because the State of the Union is only a few minutes away. Okay. We must, we must watch that. But looking at all of what we've talked about and looking at something we haven't talked about enough, really, um, that is the, the, the cult, culture and character today. Uh, of the Ukrainian people, such as it is, um, are they going to be able to hold out? Are they going to be able to conduct a, either a, a full-on, full-tilt um, battle with the Russians so as to break the Russians' uh, uh, m m you know, morale? Uh, or are they going to uh, end uh, or, or an underground battle such as we saw in France uh, in the 40s? Um, are they going to have the stick to itiveness? Uh, to, to carry on this fight. A lot of them are leaving. 520,000 have left uh, as of today. It's a lot of people, although they have you know, 42 million, I suppose. <laughs> in, in that sense, it's not that many. But my question to you is, knowing about the Ukrainian character and culture, are they going to be able to stand fast and resist the invasion? You know, I, I would, um, um, Jay, use the um, Afghanistan um, analogy because Russia also invaded Afghanistan. And of course, the Ukrainians for the Russians represent something very different. I mean, to a certain extent, um, Afghanistan was to most Russians, you know, a foreign people, a people that they couldn't really imagine. But the Ukrainians and Russians, you know, if you think about the intermarriages and all sorts of things, 
Um, you know, you, you really are dealing with, I mean, the Russians may temporarily, and that's, this is a big if still today, uh, may take over all the cities, but then they're in for a fight. And the Ukrainians are, have proved their nationalism. And I think what the Ukrainians have done is they've inspired a new look at what democracy means, what, um, what, um, uh, what democracy means to individuals. And I have a slightly different take on uh, events that have been happening in the United States, including um, January 6th. Um, I think that many Americans are still, you know, the great overwhelming, I would say go as far as 80 to 85% of the population is um, rooted in democracy. Some have been misled about the last elections, but you'll notice that what they hold dear is the election, the electoral process and the constitution. They just think it was violated, which is, you know, untrue, but there are people on the news and people um, who make these, uh, you know, er erroneous uh, assertions. I don't say fake news because I think that, you know, that's just overused and just horrible. And most news people, uh, like for example, Chris Wallace, who was on Fox for many years, are, are decent uh, reporters. Oh, he, he, moved, a, he moved over to CNN already. You know? He did, he did. And, 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 you know, I noticed that, but, you know, for a while he was at Fox and I, I would listen to him on Sunday mornings and he, he's a good reporter. So we, gotta close, we, just... we gotta close, Carl. Um, okay. I, I tell you my takeaway from all of this, you know, just as the United States, you point out, is is diverse, sometimes kicking and screaming, it's diverse and maybe racist, but diverse. Um, so so is um, Russia, and so is Ukraine, and Ukraine is a combination of cultures, it's diverse, um, and it's related to Russia. So when you send Russian troops into a place that has a lot of Russian people, you're really setting, you're setting up a kind of civil war. You're setting brother against brother. Nobody likes that. And the end is never good. The end is never permanent either, uh, as we know here in this country. But anyway, thank you, Carl. A great discussion. I look forward to more with you. And uh, of course, we're going to cover this in uh, we're going to cover this in, in some detail in uh, Global Burning Issues on April 1st. And we'll be sending out all kinds of uh, publicity and uh, registration forms on that. Thank you so much, Carl. Carl Ackerman, history professor, history social studies professor, Punaho, um, who can tell us a lot about what's going on. Thank you so much. Thank you, Jay. It's always a pleasure to be with you. Thank you so much for watching Think Tech Hawaii. If you like what we do, please like us and click the subscribe button on YouTube and the follow button on Vimeo. You can also follow us on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and LinkedIn, and donate to us at thinktechhawaii.com. Mahalo.